formed my heart You never leave me No matter where I go He knows my name Our Father in heaven, we are so thankful that tonight we can approach you not only as your servants, but as your children. And you're a Father that always looks out for us, a Father that always has our best interest in mind. Lord, we pray that the cleansing work that Jesus is doing right now in heaven's sanctuary would take place in the sanctuary of our hearts, our minds, our lives. Father, I pray that you please hide me behind the cross. Fill this place with your spirit. Fill me with your spirit. Speak to us today and help us to hear. We ask this and we pray this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Our message tonight is entitled, Watch the Lamb. In the past two nights, we've been going on with this theme of how the Lord told us it's of the importance of watching and praying here in these last days. And we've seen the last two nights the reason why we need to watch, keep our eyes open, and pray without ceasing is because a great crisis is about to break upon us. And for those who are not watching, it's going to break upon them with blinding force. But as we see this crisis looming on the horizon of our world, we have been given the precious promise in the sixth volume of the Testimonies, page 404. We read it before. Let's read it again. It says, The great crisis is just before us. To meet its trials and temptations and to perform its duties will require persevering faith. What kind of faith? A faith that perseveres. Then it says, but we may triumph gloriously, and not one watching, praying, believing soul will be ensnared by the enemy. You see, we face a mighty enemy, but the Bible says, greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. Can you say amen? amen. And the promise is given that when we watch and pray and believe, we may triumph gloriously. And friends, that phrase, triumph gloriously, is a reference to what Moses and the children of Israel experienced when God had set them free from Egyptian bondage. After going through the Red Sea and when the Lord destroyed the Egyptian armies in the Red Sea, they began to sing the song of Moses. I will sing unto the Lord for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider he has thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength and song, and he has become my salvation. This was the song that they sang, for they had triumphed gloriously through the power of God. And friends, that promise is for us in the last days. 
for the final generation, it says in Revelation 15 that they also sing the song of Moses and the Lamb for the experience that the Moses and the Israelites had when they were set free from Egypt will be the experience of God's people as the Lord sets us free from the slavery of sin in this world. Can you say amen? And we will cross the Jordan and enter into the heavenly Canaan, the heavenly promised land. But remember, for this promise, there's a condition to be met. And the condition was that we need to watch and pray and believe, and we need to have a faith that endures and perseveres the dark days ahead of us. But the question is, as we look at this phrase, watch and pray from a different angle tonight, the question is, what are we to watch? We learned before that we need to watch the signs. We need to watch the what? We need to look around us to see what's taking place in this world. And while we may not know the time of the morning that is the coming of Christ, we have been, in, uh, uh, we have been told that we are instructed and required to know when that time is near and we are to know the time of night. Why? Because God calls us to be watchmen in a world full of darkness. And friends, I want you to know tonight that we can watch the signs, and we need to, but we can know all the signs and still be lost. For knowing the signs, knowing who the beast is, is not going to bring salvation. And many people in our world are focusing on the beast so much to the point where they lose sight of the lamb. You see, we are not only to watch the signs, we are to watch the Savior. Can you say amen? You see, just before Jerusalem was destroyed by the Roman armies, there was a watchman in Jerusalem, a man, a, a man that knew the signs, and he went throughout Jerusalem warning people of the destruction that was about to take place. And this man is described in the book Great Controversy in page 30. It says this, For seven years, a man, we don't know who he is, but it says, For seven years, a man continued to go up and down the streets of Jerusalem, declaring the woes that were to come upon the city. His warning cry ceased not until he was what? Slain in the siege that he had foretold. So it says here in this book that there was a man, a watchman, that went throughout Jerusalem just before it was destroyed in A.D. 70, and he began to uh, uh, share the woes that would fall upon Jerusalem, warning people that destruction was imminent. And he continued to give the message faithfully until he himself was slain in the siege that he had foretold. But, and friends, what's interesting about this is the very next sentence says, not one Christian perished in the destruction of Jerusalem. Not one what? But did this watchman perish, yes or no? Yes, which shows that while he knew the signs, he was still lost. And friends, what a tragedy to know the signs, but not know the Savior. What a tragedy to know all the intricacies of Bible prophecy, the timeline and events of what's going to take place in the last days, and yet not be saved at last. This man, he knew the signs, but he did not know the Savior. And so it's very important. The past few nights, we've been looking at the signs, and we see that, yes, they're taking place right before our very eyes. But not only watching the signs, we need to watch the Savior. You see, we must watch for the signs to give the warning. But there's something else we need to watch in order to receive the blessing. We need to behold the Lamb of God. Notice the question, what else are we called to watch in the last days? Let's open our Bibles to the book of Luke, chapter 21. We read it before, but let's read it again as we repeat and enlarge on some of the things we've discussed on previous nights. Luke, what chapter are we going to? Luke, chapter 21, and if you read the context, it's about the end of time, the signs of the times. And in this context, we are not only to watch the signs, but Jesus said, Luke 21 and verse 28, if you're there, would you please say amen? <clears throat> Christ said, and when these things begin to come to pass, look where? Look up 
and lift up your heads for your redemption draws nigh. So Jesus made it clear that we need to look around so that we might see the things come to pass. We might see the signs, but don't focus on those things. After you recognize the fulfillment of the signs, the fulfillment of prophecy, then look up, lift up your heads and focus not on earthly, but on heavenly things. So the Bible says that in these last days, we are called to look up. But the question tonight is, what's up? We're called to look up, but what's up? Let's go now to the book of Hebrews chapter 12. As we see more specifically, what are we to look upon as we gaze up into the heavens? Luke chapter 12, beginning with verse 1, and here the apostle Paul likens salvation to a race. And we may have a good beginning, but God wants us to have a glorious ending as well. What a tragedy to start off good, but to fail of reaching the finish line. And so the Bible says here that in order for us to finish the race, we have to look at something. Notice what it says in Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 1. If you're there, would you please say amen? The Bible says, Wherefore, seeing we are also compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with what? Let us run with patience the race that is set before us. So here the uh, salvation is likened unto a race. And the only way that we can finish this race is if we have persevering faith. We must endure by faith all the way to the end. But the question is, how do we get such a faith like this? A faith that endures all the way to the end, a faith that actually brings us across the finish line. It tells us in verse 2 how. Notice what it says we are to look upon. It says, looking unto who? Jesus. And friends, when we look at Jesus, we find a faith that has endured to the end. And so by beholding Jesus, whose faith was made perfect and went all the way to the finish line, we have that faith as well. And when we look upon Christ, what do we see specifically? It says, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured, what did he do? endure? Endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Don't miss the details, friends. In the last days, we're not only to watch the signs, we're to look up to see the Savior. And when we look upon Him, we see that what He has begun, He is able to finish. Can you say amen? Many times we start things and we can't finish it. But when God starts something, He is more than able to finish what He has started. And it says that the faith that He has uh, given to us in our lives, He is able to finish, for He is the author and the finisher of our faith. But friends, you know that word finisher, it literally means the perfecter. Of our faith. What does it mean? In other words, he wants to make our faith perfect. He's begun it and he wants to perfect it. And friends, when you look that up, friends, a perfecter is one who has in his own person raised faith to its perfection and so set before us the highest example of faith. In other words, when we look upon Jesus, we see a perfect faith. The faith of Jesus is a pure and perfect faith. For each and every day that Christ walked upon this world, he had implicit faith upon the promises of his Father, and he overcomes Satan not by using his divine power, but by the power, power that's available to us as he quoted, it is written over and over again, claiming the promises and the power of God's word. Can you say amen? amen. And so Jesus has a perfect and pure faith. And when we look upon him, the author and finisher of our faith, by beholding his faith, we become changed, and he is able through time to perfect and finish our faith. Can you say amen? Now, it says that he is the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him, how do we see the faith of Jesus demonstrated? It says he endured the cross, despising the shame, but after that, as set down at the right hand of where? the throne of God. In other words, the faith of Jesus. You know where we see it? We see it at the cross. But tonight we're going to see that we also find the faith of Jesus in what he is doing right now at the throne of God. You see, at the cross, Jesus died for us. 
But at the throne of God, He lives for us and ever lives to make intercession for us. And so we see that the, the, there's something about the cross and about the throne of God, the most holy place, the Ark of the Covenant, that's connected, that teaches us about the faith of Jesus and how what God begun in our lives, He is able to bring to fruition. He is able to complete it and perfect it. Are you with me, yes or no? Now I want us to notice the only way to get a faith is to look at the author and finisher of our faith. So this text is pointing us to look at the faith of Jesus at the cross and at the throne of God. And friends, the reason why this is important, because remember, as a watchman, we are to make plain so that he that reads it may run. Do you remember that in Habakkuk? It said, make it plain so he that reads may run. In order for us to finish the race, in order for us to run with an enduring faith, we have to make it plain. And the question is, what makes plain the way of salvation and the way of Christ? We learned before on previous nights that in Psalm 77 and verse 13, the thing that makes plain the way of God, it says, Thy way, O God, is found where? In the sanctuary. Who is so great a God as our God? You see, there's something about the sanctuary message, the types and services in that Old Testament temple that makes plain for us the way of salvation, something about the sanctuary that makes plain the faith of Jesus. And as we see it, we find how He can finish what has, He has begun in our lives. And so what about the sanctuary makes plain the faith of Jesus? I want us to notice now, here's the question. In relation to the sanctuary, where does our faith begin and where does our faith end? In the sanctuary, where does faith begin? What is the first act of faith in the sanctuary? Friends, we find the answer in the book of Hebrews chapter 5. Please open your Bible now with me to Hebrews chapter 5. I can tell you briefly, but it's more powerful if we see it from the Word of God for ourselves. Amen? So notice as we go to Hebrews, what chapter did I say? And remember, what's the question? Jesus is the author and finisher of our faith. And so question in relation to the sanctuary that makes plain the faith of Jesus, that makes plain the way of righteousness, in relation to that sanctuary, where does our faith begin and where does our faith end or where is it perfected? Hebrews chapter 5, beginning with verse 9, and if you're there, would you please say amen? The Bible says in Hebrews 5, beginning with verse 5, So also Christ glorified not himself to be made an high priest, but he that said unto him, Thou art my son, Today have I begotten thee. And he said in another place, Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Verse 7, Who in the days of his flesh, when he offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears, unto him that was able to save him from what? This is talking about Christ, the great high priest. But it talks about him in the days of his flesh. That is the time when he was incarnated into this world. And he walked up among men. And during this time in his flesh, it says that when he had offered up prayers and supplications with strong cryings and tears, a time when Jesus was wrestling with God in prayer, wrestling with his father, the one, the only one that could save him from death. Now, friends, when do you suppose this was taking place? When was it that Jesus was praying to the Father with tears and supplication uh, for deliverance from death? It was in the Garden of Gethsemane. That's what this text is referring to. Remember when Jesus was in, in that garden? The weight of the world's sins was being laid upon the sin bearer, and it was so heavy that Christ did not feel. He did not what? He didn't feel like dying right there and then. His feelings were coming up, and he didn't feel like drinking the cup. And that's why in his prayers with tears and supplication to the Father, the one who could save him from the death, he said, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. You see, Jesus, in that moment, did not feel like dying for you and dying for me. But praise the Lord that our God does not live by feelings but by faith. Can you say amen? And so what we're seeing here is the faith of Jesus, the faith that is perfect and pure. Christ could have said, let me go back to the Father. He could have called 10,000 angels 
to leave us in our own destruction and to deliver him from the, the, the death that he was about to experience. And he could have said, forget about it. My disciples are sleeping on me. They don't even care about this. Let me just go back to heaven. He could have done it, friends. But if he did, we would be lost. And Christ could not bear the thought of the human race, his children being lost. So instead of going by his feelings... He endured the cross by faith. Can you say amen? Now notice what it says the rest of the verse. It says, verse 7, Who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with strong cryings and tears unto him that was able to save him from death, and was heard in that he was. So when Jesus prayed in Gethsemane, was he heard by the Father, yes or no? Yes. Why? Because it says, in that he Feared And friends, that word feared, it literally means he had a reverential submission to the will of the Father. In other words, he could have went on through his feelings. And the, but, but the reason why his prayer was heard is because he feared God more than, uh, more than death. And so he uh, submitted himself to the will of the Father. You see, Jesus did not demand for his will to be done. He didn't say, Father, remove this cup. He did not demand for his will to be done, but rather he concluded that prayer by saying, nevertheless, not as I will, but thy will be done, in that he feared, and as a result of submitting himself in a reverential way to the will of the Father, his prayer was heard. But how was his prayer heard, friends? Did the Father remove the cup? Yes or no? So the Father heard the Son's prayer. And gave an answer, the Father did not give Jesus so much what he wanted, but he gave Jesus what he needed, and that was strength to endure the cross, friends. And that shows us that when we pray, the Lord doesn't always give us what we want, but he always gives to us what we need. Can you say amen? You know, sometimes we pray and God doesn't answer our prayers exactly how we ask it. You know why? Because sometimes when we pray, we ask God for Snickers, and what we really need is broccoli. Sometimes we think we know what's best for us, but I'm thankful that God is a lot smarter than us. Can you see amen? Is God smarter than us? Absolutely. He can see the end from the beginning. He is the end from the beginning. And so when Jesus, with prayers and tears, said, let the cup pass, he wasn't demanding for his will to be done, but he feared God. He submitted himself to the will of God. He said, not my will, but your will be done. The father heard that prayer, did not give Jesus so much what he wanted, but what he needed, and that was a faith that would continue to endure all the way to the end. And friends, as a result of this sacrifice, notice what it says in verse 8. It says, though he were a son, were a son, Yet learn he obedience through the things which he what? suffered. In other words, he became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross, as a result of his prayer in Gethsemane. But then, as a result, notice verse 9. Follow me now. It all connects together, friends. Verse 9 says, and remember, what's the question? What's the question? Where does faith begin and where is it perfected in relation to the sanctuary? That's the question, right? Here's the answer, verse 9. And being made perfect. Being made what? That doesn't mean that Jesus wasn't perfect before then. He was always perfect. You see, when the Bible says that Christ being made perfect, it literally means that he finished the mission, or the, 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 the mission he came to do was made perfect. In other words, he endured the cross and he died for the sins of the human race as a result of submitting himself to the will of God in Gethsemane, being made perfect. In other words, he went all the way and his faith was perfected or it was finished when he crossed the finish line at the cross and said, it is finished. Are you with me, yes or no? Amen. So it says, and being made perfect or dying on the cross, he became the, what is that word? He be, uh, friends, are you with me tonight? He became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. So what's the question? Where does faith begin in relation to the sanctuary? At the cross, friends. And where is the cross located in the sanctuary? The altar of burnt offering. That's where faith begins. 
because that's where Jesus died. And as a result of his death, he is now be able to become the author of our faith. In other words, friends, because he finished his earthly ministry, we can now have a heavenly experience. Can you say amen? He finished his earthly ministry at the cross. And because of this, he would raise, he would go back, ascending to the throne of God. Remember, he endured the cross, but then it sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. And friends, he became the author of our faith when dying upon the cross. That's the altar burnt offering there in the entrance to the sanctuary. But question, where does he perfect or finish our faith? It begins at the cross, but where does our faith become perfected? Friends, it takes place at the throne of God. And that's why he went to the throne of God. He becomes the finisher of our faith when blotting out our sins in the most holy place there in heaven's sanctuary. And thus, he is not only the author, but he's the finisher of our faith. That's why Paul said in Hebrews 12 that we need to look unto Jesus, the author and finisher. And where do we see him authoring and finishing it? He endured the cross, authoring our faith. But then he finished it when he sits down at the right hand of the throne of God. Are you with me, yes or no? In other words, Jesus is the beginning and the end. That's why he, it says that he is the Alpha and Omega. Omega, The beginning and the end. For what he has begun in our lives, he is able to bring it to fruition. And when we look into the sanctuary, friends, we find how God does this in our lives. Now I want us to notice. These two events, what two events? The cross and what Jesus is doing right now in the heavenly sanctuary in the most holy place. His sacrifice on the cross and the investigative judgment in the blotting out of sins, these two events are connected together. Notice what it says in the book Great Controversy, page 489. Great Controversy 49 says this, The intercession of Christ in man's behalf in the sanctuary above, or at the throne of God, is as essential. It's as what? Essential to the plan of salvation as was his death upon the cross. In other words, what Jesus begun at the cross and what he's doing right now in heaven's sanctuary are both connected and they are both essential. It says, his, uh, by his death he began that work which after his resurrection he ascended to complete where? He's the author and the finisher or completer or perfecter. And he would complete it in heaven. And then it says, we must by faith enter within the veil, the throne of God, the throne of grace, whither the forerunner is for us entered. And what do we see when we enter within the veil? What do we see when we go by faith into the most holy place of heaven's sanctuary? It says, there the light from the cross of Calvary is reflected. And there we may gain a what kind of insight? a clearer insight into the mysteries of redemption. So friends, it's good for us to understand the cross, but we also have to understand what Jesus is doing right now in heaven's sanctuary. Because at the cross, he dies for us, but in the most holy place, he lives for us to intercede for us. And it says that when we look into the most holy place, the throne of God where Jesus intercedes for us and blots out the record of sin, it says that the light from the cross is reflected in the sanctuary. And in that sanctuary, we find a more clearer insight to the mysteries of redemption. I don't know about you, but I want a clearer insight. Can you say amen? And so right now, we're going to look into the sanctuary where Jesus, our heavenly high priest, intercedes for us. That's why, brothers and sisters, the Bible says that we need to lift up our eyes. We need to look up for our redemption draws nigh. And when we look up, we see Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. We see him in the most holy place, perfecting and finishing the work that he's begun in our lives. And that's why in this last day, the final generation must not only look around to see the signs, but they must look up to see the Savior perfecting and finishing the faith that has, he has begun in us. Can you say amen? And so here's the next question. What happens in the most holy place that makes redemption clearer? How is the cross of Calvary, the author of our faith, 
How is that reflected in the most holy place in the sanctuary above? Brothers and sisters, tonight we're going to look into the mysteries of redemption. And I believe it's, it's so deep, friends. We're going to be studying the mysteries of redemption throughout the ceaseless ages of eternity. Can you say amen? And I believe that many of us have a grasp about the redemption story. We understand that Jesus died. He took our place on the cross. But tonight we want to look a little bit deeper into the, the science of salvation in the, in the light of the great controversy between good and evil and why everything was not so much finished at the cross and why Jesus has to continue on another phase of his ministry in heaven. What he has begun at the cross he is finishing in the kingdom of heaven, in the sanctuary, in the most holy place. And so question, what happens in the most holy place? John the Baptist. Baptist. In John chapter 1 and verse 29, the first forerunner of Christ. Before, when Jesus came that first time, John the Baptist was his forerunner, and he called the people to behold the Lamb. To do what? In other words, to watch the Lamb. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the what? Sin of the world. The first forerunner of Christ, John the Baptist, called the world to behold the Lamb. And when we see the Lamb, we see that his role, his mission, is to take away the sin of the world. But the question is, how does Jesus take away the sin of the world? He does it at the cross, but he also does it right now in the sanctuary. You see, there are two things that must happen in order for the sin of the world to be taken away. And by the way, before we get into that, actually, let's get into that and I'll come back to the thought I just had in my mind. How does Jesus take away sin? Two things must happen. Number one is found in Hebrews 9 and verse 22. Hebrews 9, 22 says, without shedding of blood, there is no what? The only way sins can be remitted, taken away, forgiven, and cleansed is that blood needs to be shed. And where did Jesus shed his blood? At the cross. And where is that cross in relation to the sanctuary? It's at the altar of burnt offering, the author of our faith. So Jesus, in order for him to take away the sin of the world, he had to shed his blood. But when you study the Old Testament sanctuary, the blood of the sacrificial animal not only had to be shed... But that blood then had to be applied. It had to be what? Applied in the most holy place. Notice what it says, Leviticus 17 and verse 11. Write it down. It says, For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that makes an atonement for the soul. So we see, brothers and sisters, that in order for the Lamb of God to take away the sin of the world, he had to shed his blood, but then he had to apply his blood to the record of our lives. And where is that found? In the sanctuary, in the most holy place. So blood had to be shed and blood had to be applied in order for the sin of the world to be removed. And if that's clear, let me hear you say amen. And where was this applied in relation to the sanctuary? Blood was shed right there at the altar of burnt offering. That's where our faith begins as the sinner had to take a, a knife and to cut the juggler blade, a vein of an innocent animal. The blood would flow and the priest was there to catch the blood. This symbolized, friends, that in order for the guilty to be pardoned, something innocent had to die because the wages of sin is death. And friends, what happened at the altar of burnt offering was a symbol of the cross. And friends, the only way that Jesus could be our Savior is he had to be without sin. He had to be pure and innocent. And I'm so thankful that he gained the victory over temptation in every single point. Thus, he could be our, our sacrifice. Can you see amen? This, where the, this is where the blood was shed, right there at the altar burnt offering. This is where the faith is authored. But where is the blood applied on the Day of Atonement? The high priest would take the blood of that sacrificial animal that was slain right there at the altar in the sanctuary. Then uh, he would go into the sanctuary within the veil into the most holy place where the Ark of the Covenant was with that uh, chest-like piece of furniture overlaid with gold inside and outside and on the inside contained the Ten Commandments, the justice and righteousness of God. 
Above the Ten Commandments that covered the chest-like piece of furniture was a solid slab of gold. It was called the mercy seat. What was it called? And the blood was sprinkled or applied right there on that mercy seat. And symbolically, when that priest did that, it cleansed the sanctuary of all the record of sin. And thus, the sins that, that, that stained the record of our lives would be blot out forever. So in order for the Lamb of God to take away the sin of the world, blood had to be shed, and then it had to be applied. The blood was shed where? At the altar burnt offering, the author of our faith. But where was it applied? In the most holy place, right there at the mercy seat. It was applied, and that's where our faith is become perfected and finished as sin is blotted out forever. And just as the first forerunner, John the Baptist, called the world to behold the Lamb of God to take away the sin of the world, so too the other forerunners of Christ, the final forerunners, in other words, God's people here in these last days, just like John the Baptist, they will give a call to the world to behold the Lamb Lamb of God, to watch the Lamb as He takes away the sin of the world, but not only at the cross, but also in the most holy place. For at the cross, Jesus died for us, but in the most holy place, He lives to make intercession for us. Can you say amen? And so too, God is calling for us to be His forerunners to prepare the way for the second coming of Christ. And the thing that ushers in the coming of Christ is when the whole world is illuminated with a message that is found in the cross, but that is also reflected in the most holy place as we understand the investigative judgment and the blotting out of sin that Jesus is doing and how he not only authored and begun our faith, but he's able to bring it to completion and perfection. Can you say amen? And so tonight we're looking into the mysteries of redemption. And as we continue along, we notice that faith begins at the cross, but it's completed in the most holy place. And if that's clear, let me hear you say amen. Why is it completed in the most holy place? Because, friends, it's in the most holy place where we find safety and a shelter in a time of storm. Friends, the reason why God's people will point people to the most holy place, remember what we studied on previous nights? As watchmen, we are to warn people of the danger, but we're also point people to the safety. And friends, where is the only safety in these last days? It's in the most holy place. And that's why as we turn to Psalms 91, it's a psalm of the last days. And if we, as we read it tonight, we're going to see that there is sanctuary language in this psalm. And by the way, friends, you ought to memorize this whole chapter. Psalms 91 is for you and, you and I who are living in the final hours of earth's history. It is pointing us to go into the secret place of the Most High. That's the most holy place where Jesus ever lives to make intercession for us. Notice what it says, Psalms 91, beginning of verse 1. We're going to read the whole thing together. And if you're there, would you please say amen? Oh, friends, this is beautiful. It says in Psalms 91 and verse 1, He that dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Friends, what's the secret place of the Most High? It's the most holy place in heaven's sanctuary. And as we dwell in that place by faith, we are abiding under the shadow of Almighty God. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress. My God, in Him will I trust. Surely He shall deliver me from the snare of the fowler and from the noisome pestilence. He shall cover thee with His feathers. And under his what? Wings thou shalt trust. His truth shall be thy shield and buckler. Friends, what does it mean under his wings? Where do we find the wings in the sanctuary? Right there in the most holy place. Remember the angels who had their wings spread over the, the Shekinah glory? And so to be under his wings means to be sitting at the most holy place, at the mercy seat, to abide in the presence of God. Can you say amen? This is the only place of safety when trouble comes, it says he's going to cover us with his feathers. We're going to abide under his wings. I want to be under his wings. How about you, friends? And then it says in verse 5, because we're abiding in that secret place, in the most holy place by faith, verse 5 says, Thou shalt not be afraid of the terror by night, nor of the arrow that flies by day, nor for the pestilence that walks in the darkness, nor for the destruction that wakes, wasteth at noonday. A thousand shall fall at thy side, and ten thousand at thy right hand, but it shall not come nigh thee. 
Only with thine eyes shall thou behold and see the reward of the wicked. Why is it that we're going to see the reward of the wicked with our eyes? Because God is not going to rapture his church before tribulation. We're going to go through tribulation. But as long as we abide in Christ in the most holy place by faith, we will not be touched. Can you say amen? It says... Verse 9, because thou hast made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the Most High, thy habitation. And there shall no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling. When the seven last plagues are poured out, there is safety in the most holy place by faith as we abide in Christ. Verse 11, for he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. And they shall bear thee up in their hands, lest thou dash thy foot against the stone. And thou shalt tread upon the lion and adder. What does the lion and adder represent? It represents Satan, friends. He's like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. The adder, which is the serpent, it says that we're going to stomp upon the lion. We're going to crush him under our feet. Does that sound familiar? That's what happens in the third round. We studied that before when we talked about the champion of love. And then it says, because he has set his love upon me, Therefore will I deliver him, and I will set him on high, because he hath known my name. Friends, how do we know the name or the character or the glory of God? We know it by going into the secret place of God, by going into the sanctuary, the most holy place. We know the name of God, friends. And then it says, he shall call upon me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. And with long life will I satisfy him and show him my salvation. And all God's people said, Amen. Oh, friends, isn't that a beautiful psalm? This psalm is inviting us to go into the most holy place. And God's forerunners in the last days, they, like John the Baptist, give a call to the world to behold the Lamb to watch the Lamb of God, to take their eyes off of the depressing, the depressing things of this world and to turn their eyes upon Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith, to know what He's doing right now in the heavenly sanctuary. Now, as we continue to go deeper tonight, we see that Jesus begins our faith at the cross, at the altar of an offering, but He perfects our faith. He completes our faith in the most holy place. He begins our faith when He sheds His blood at the cross. But our faith is perfected when He applies the blood to our record in the sanctuary as our sins are blotted out. And so here's the question. What happens in the most holy place when the blood was applied? In the most holy place when the high priest applied the blood, right there on the mercy seat, we find that the cross is reflected therein through the blood. Not only that, but we also see that the mysteries of redemption become clearer to us. And we understand the plan of salvation more in depth. How, you ask? Well, what happens in the most holy place? Notice what it says in Psalms 85 and verse 10. Write it down. Psalms 85, 10 says, Mercy and truth. What two things? Mercy and truth are met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed each other. You see, mercy and truth, or the mercy of God and the truth or the justice of God, make up the character of God, the glory of God. You see, God's justice and God's mercy are two sides of the same coin. God is completely merciful and completely justice at the same time. And we see that the mercy of God and the justice or the truth of God have met together and have kissed each other. In other words, the mercy of God and the justice of God are always in agreement. They're not diametrically opposed to each other. They are in harmony with each other. Are you with me, yes or no? Now, here's the question. Where is it do we find the mercy and the justice of God coming together most clearly? We find it in two places. Mainly. How many places? Where do we find God's justice and mercy blended so perfectly? Number one, we find it at the cross where the blood was shed and where Jesus authored our faith. For at the cross, the justice of the law was served and at the same time, mercy to the sinner 
was given. You see, when we look at the cross, the reason why Jesus died was because we were guilty and deserved death. You see, when Adam and Eve and when the human race broke the law of God, they were going against the justice of God's law. And the justice of the law demanded death for its transgressions. For this, what it, the, the justice means right, righteousness. You see, it is absolutely just, fair, and right for us to die because we've broken the law. Are you with me, yes or no? That's the justice of God. It is absolutely fair, just, and right for us to die because we have broken the law of God. And so the law demands death to the one that has broken it. Why? Because the foundation of the law of God, the law of God is all about the love of God. Can you say amen? Jesus, or the Bible says in Romans 13 that love is the fulfilling or the establishing of the law. The law of God is not bondage, friends. The law of God is freedom. It's ten principles of freedom. It's right. It's fair. It's logical. It's, it's for our own good, the Bible says. And if the law of God is love, you see, God's love, which is demonstrated in His law, the love of God brings life. Can you say amen? The love of God compelled God to create us and give us life. And so when we break the law of God, we are sinning against God, and the root of sin is the opposite of love. The root of sin is selfishness. It is what? You see, the law is all about love. Sin, which is the breaking of the law, is about selfishness. It's about doing your own thing, doing your will. And the reason why that the result of breaking the law of love is death is because there is no life in selfishness. There is no happiness in selfishness. When you live your life only for yourself, you are a miserable person. There is no life in selfishness, and that's why the wages of sin is death. Because the result of selfishness is death, brothers and sisters. Are you with me, yes or no? And so when Jesus died on the cross, the law that demanded death for the transgressors, that, the, the demands of the law were met, the justice of God, the what? Justice of God was satisfied at the cross. But at the same time, in meeting the justice of the law, Jesus, through his death, was giving mercy to the transgressor. Can you say amen? And so at the cross, the justice or the truth of God and the mercy or the peace of God met together and kissed. And that's where our faith is authored. That's where the blood was shed. You see, in dying on the cross, Christ showed that God's justice does not do away with God's mercy. And the reason why I'm emphasizing this is because this is how the great controversy between good and evil actually began. You see, Satan's first uh, accusation against God is that his law could not be kept. And as a result of breaking the law of God, that God had to put to death anyone that broke the law of God. I want us to notice now from the book Desire of Ages, page 6, or excuse me, Desire of Ages 761. I want you to write it down. Read the whole thing when you get home. I'm going to read a lot of it tonight because it explains it far better than I can explain it. Amen? You don't mind if I quote the spirit of prophecy, do you? It says in Desire of Ages 761, in the opening of the great controversy, Satan had declared that the law of God could not be obeyed. That justice was what? Inconsistent with mercy. Friends, what is God's character? Justice and mercy. And so in saying that justice is inconsistent with mercy, Satan essentially, in the beginning of the great controversy, he was attacking the character of God. He was doing what? He was saying, God, you're not really who you say you are. You're not really a loving God. You're not really a just and fair God. Satan was saying that God was, was inconsistent, that he was not really love, and he was not really just. Justice was inconsistent with mercy, and that should the law be broken, it would be impossible for the sinner to be pardoned. Every sin must meet its punishment, urged Satan. And if God should remit or forgive the punishment of sin, he would not be a God of truth and justice. In other words, Satan was claiming, if you forgive the sinner, then you're not really justice as you say you are. You're not really fair. That's not fair. They deserve death. To forgive them when they deserve death, that's not fair. You see what Satan is doing? He's saying that the mercy and the justice are not 
compatible. And then it says, when men broke the law of God and defiled his will, Satan exalted. It was proved, he declared, that the law could not be obeyed and that man could not be forgiven because he, after his rebellion, had been banished from heaven. Satan claimed that the human race must be forever shut out from God's favor. God could not be just, he urged, and yet show mercy to the sinner. So what is Satan's claim in the beginning of the great controversy? God, you're not justice, you're not mercy. Justice and mercy cannot go together. Man had sinned, they broke the law of God, they deserve to be banished from your favor. And if you forgive them and take them to heaven, you are not fair, you are not just. Mercy, if, if having mercy, you are breaking your justice. But friends, notice, by his life and his what? Notice what Jesus did to refute this accusation. Desire of Ages 762, it says, by his life and his death, Christ, what is that word? Proved that God's justice did not destroy his mercy, but that sin could be forgiven and that the law is righteous and can be perfectly obeyed. Satan's charges were refuted. God had given man unmistakable evidence of his love. By living a perfect life, Jesus showed that the law could be kept even in sinful flesh. And by dying his death, Jesus proved that mercy could be given to those who did not deserve it. And then notice what else happened. Same page. God's love, God's what? Or God's character. The harmony of God's love and character had, has been expressed in His what? Justice no less than in His mercy. Justice is the foundation of His throne and the fruit of his love. It had been Satan's purpose to divorce. To do what? To divorce mercy from truth and justice. He sought to prove that the righteousness of God's law is an enemy to peace. But Christ shows that in God's plan, they are indissolubly joined together. What is that word? How do you say that word? Indis indissolubly. Thank you very much. I'm still learning English if you, if you didn't find out. Indissolubly joined together, the one cannot exist without the other. In other words, God is justice and God is mercy at the same time. These two characteristics are not inconsistent. They are in harmony with each other. And the cross has proven that the justice of the law, the demands of the law have been satisfied as Jesus took our place. But in, in meeting the justice of the law, Christ simultaneously was able to offer mercy to the transgressor, the entire human race, and thus there at the cross, at the author of our faith, we find justice and mercy meeting together and kissing. Can you say amen? And thus Satan's accusations is refuted false. But I want us to notice as we continue on looking into the mysteries of redemption tonight that after the cross, Satan had another accusation to throw at God. In other words, there was something else that God had to vindicate even after the cross. What was that? Desire of Ages. 672, it says, Another deception was now to be brought forward. What was this deception? Satan declared that mercy did what? Destroyed justice. And that the death of Christ abrogated the Father's law. And now Satan was, went to the opposite extreme. After the cross, when God was able to give mercy to the entire human race, now Satan made the accusation, your mercy is now doing away with the justice or the law of God. Had it been possible for the law to be changed or abrogated, then Christ need not have died. But to abrogate the law would be to immortalize transgression and place the world under Satan's control. It was because the law was changeless, because man could be saved only through obedience to its precepts, that Jesus was lifted up on the cross. Yet the very means, listen very carefully, friends. Don't lose, uh, don't lose me, friends. The very means by which Christ established the law. What, what, what is that? What is the very means it's referring to? That Christ established the unchangeableness of his law. The cross. 
Rather than change the law, Jesus would die on the cross. And in dying on the cross, he is establishing his justice, the fairness of his law. Are you with me, yes or no? And so the very means, in other words, the cross, by which Christ had established the law, notice what Satan did. Satan represented as destroying it. In other words, Satan was saying, your cross is now doing away with the law. Your mercy is destroying your justice. You are still an inconsistent God, a God that is not really who you say you are. Satan represented as destroying it. And here will come the last conflict of the great controversy between Christ and Satan. Friends, do you see it? What happened at the cross, the accusation that Satan put forward was part of it was proven at the cross. But the last accusation that mercy somehow destroys justice, that somehow God's grace gives us license to continue in sin, it's going to be refuted at the end when Christ perfects our faith in the most holy place where he ever lives to make intercession for us. Can you say amen? Friends, do you see the connection? I don't know if I explained it very clearly, but Satan says that Satan essentially is attacking the character of God. The first accusation, God, there is no such thing as love and mercy. Justice must be delivered. The world must die. Christ dies instead, proving that justice could be maintained and mercy forgiven at the same time. That accusation proven false. The next accusation, at the end of time, Satan says, the mercy, the grace of God does away with the justice of God. It does away with the law of God. But friends, at the end of time, God will reveal in the most holy place and in the work he does in our lives that God's mercy doesn't destroy the law, but God's mercy enables us to actually keep the law in full obedience. Can you say amen? And so what must Christ do now? Now Christ must vindicate the fairness and justice of his law, and he must demonstrate to the world and the universe how his mercy doesn't break the law, but his mercy enables us to keep the law of God. He does this in the most holy place as he brings our life into harmony with the law of God as he perfects the faith that has begun at the cross. Can you say amen? Now as we take a look, a deeper look at the mystery of redemption, we find it in the sanctuary. For in the sanctuary, the cross of Christ, the light from the cross is reflected. And that's why we must lift up our eyes to see what Jesus is doing right now in heaven's sanctuary. You see, in the most holy place, we find how Jesus would perfect the faith and how through his mercy he would demonstrate that his mercy enables us to keep the perfect law of God. How does he do it? Where does he do it? Most holy place. What was in the most holy place? For at the cross we find the justice and mercy of God kissing, but the second place, I told you there are two places, that we find mercy and justice kissing. We find it at the cross, and the second place we find it in the most holy place. You know how? What article of furniture was in the most holy place? The Ark of the Covenant. What was contained in the Ark of the Covenant? The Ten Commandments, which is the law of God or the justice of God. It was God's requirements. But right above the law of God was a solid slab of gold. And that solid slab of gold was called the mercy seat. Friends, we see justice and mercy kissing at the cross, but we also see it reflected in the most holy place. The law of God, the justice of God, and the mercy of God are right there meeting together. And in these last days, in the sanctuary, in the most holy place, God reveals how mercy and justice go hand in hand. How so? Oh, friends, listen. It was at the mercy seat that the blood was sprinkled. What kind of blood was shed for our sins? Not sinful blood but a pure blood that came from a pure life. The life is in the blood. And so at the Ark of the Covenant, when the blood was sprinkled, it was pure blood that was shed to meet the justice of the law. And when this blood was applied in the most holy place, it forgave the sinner of sin. 
But not only that. That blood that was applied in the most holy place also has the power not only to cleanse and forgive, but it has the power to bring us back into harmony with the justice or the law of God. Brothers and sisters, this is how Christ perfects our faith. He applies the blood, and friends, there is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of Jesus, not only to forgive, but like the song says, would you be free from the burden of sin? There is power in the blood of the Lamb. Can you say amen? You see, in the most holy place, Jesus shows how mercy doesn't do aside, uh, doesn't do away with the law of God, but rather the mercy of God, the blood of Christ, brings us back into harmony with the law of God as our faith is perfected, as God has a people in the last days that will perfectly reflect the character of God in their own life. And some of you are thinking to yourself, is it really possible? to keep the law perfectly by faith? Is it really possible for Jesus to perfect our faith in these last days? Is it really possible for the mercy of God's, uh, 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 from the blood of Jesus to bring our life back into complete harmony with the God of heaven? Is it possible to have complete victory over sin? Friends, I'm happy to tell you tonight that through faith in the blood of Christ, with men, it's impossible, but not with God, for with God, all things are possible. Can you say amen? amen? And this is what the Bible teaches. How do we know? Notice what it says in the book of Jude, chapter 1, verse 24. Let's read this together, shall we? Jude 1, verse 24, it says, Now unto him that is what? Able, Able to keep you from falling and to present you how? Faultless. Where? before the presence of His glory with exceeding joy. Amen. Friends, where is the presence of His glory? It's in the most holy place. And the Bible says that God is able. We are not able, but He's able and He's capable. Can you say amen? amen. And that's why we, can, we should never trust in ourselves. That's why self must be put to death. Because self does not have the power. The carnal man is enmity against God. We cannot keep the law of God, brothers and sisters. No matter how hard we try, all our righteousness are like filthy rags. Filthy rags. We are not able, but he's able to keep us from falling. In other words, he's able to keep us standing firm to the end. And to present us in what condition? Faultless. What does that mean, faultless? Without sin, friends. The final generation in Revelation 14, it says they are without fault before the throne of God. It says that God is able to keep us faultless before the presence of His glory with exceeding joy. Where does He finish this work in our life? He finishes it in the most holy place as the blood is applied and our sins are blotted out. You see, the blood of Jesus, the mercy of God, doesn't do away with the law of God, the justice of God, but enables us and it brings our life back into harmony with the law and in harmony with the justice of God. Can you say amen? And when God finishes this work, the second accusation of Satan will be proved false as God has a people in these last days, the final generation that will reproduce the character of God to the whole world. In fact, notice what it says in 1 John chapter 4 and verse 17. Herein is our love made perfect. Where? Where in? In the most holy place. Our love is made perfect. It's completed. That we may have boldness. We may have what? Boldness in the day of judgment. Where is judgment taking place? In the most holy place. Do you see how the Bible all connects? Herein is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. Why? Why can we be so bold in the last days? Why can we be bold in the day of judgment? Why should we never fear the judgment of what Jesus is doing? It says, because as he is. How is he? How is he? Tell me, how is he? Oh, he's marvelous. He's wonderful. What else? How is he? Tell me, friends. He's pure. He's perfect. He's righteous. He's without sin. How is he? He is everything that we are not. 
but it continues to say, as he is, so are we. Where? When he comes? In the world. In other words, in the last days, God is going to have a group of people who he will be able to perfect their faith in the most holy place to bring them back into harmony with the claims of the law in order to prove the accusation of Satan's false that mercy doesn't set aside justice, that mercy enables us to keep the law of God. And friends, notice, it's only by the mercy and the grace of God. Can you say amen? Not by might nor by power, but by his spirit. And friends, where does this take place? In the most holy place. You know why? In the most holy place, once again, we find the Ark of the Covenant. In the Ark was the law that demanded death, justice. But above that law, I'm so thankful that there was a mercy seat. You see, what happens when we go into the presence of God with sin? We are consumed. In the most holy place was the presence of God, and if we're to go in that presence with sin, we would be lost, we would be consumed, friends. And so it's interesting, when you go into the most holy place, you find the law of God that points out your sin and the presence of God that consumes your sin. But praise the Lord that in between the justice or law of God and the Shekinah glory, there was a mercy seat. And friends, what is that mercy seat? The Apostle Paul says that the mercy seat is Jesus. Amen. Amen. That mercy seat was made of what kind of gold? Pure gold. What does gold represent in the Bible? According to 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 7, it represents faith. You see, what is it that brings our lives back in harmony with the justice or law of God? It's faith in the mercy seat. And the reason why it was made of solid gold because it's a pure faith. Who's the only one that has a pure faith? Jesus. But friends, in the last days, God is going to have a final generation that's going to have not only faith in Jesus, they will have the faith of Jesus. Can you say that? Revelation 14, 12, it describes them. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God. Their lives are brought back into harmony with the justice of God. We see that mercy doesn't do away with the law, but establishes the law, proving Satan's accusations false. But how is it that they keep the commandments of God? It says, and the faith, not just in Jesus, but of Jesus. Where is the law of God and the faith of Jesus? Right there in the most holy place. Friends, God has a group of people that's going to be just like Jesus. I don't know about you, but I want to be like Jesus. At the cross, we are justified, cleansed, forgiven. But in the most holy place, we are sanctified, made just like Jesus. At the cross, Jesus authors or begins our faith, but in the most holy place, he finishes, perfects, and completes the faith. How many of you are excited about this message? If so, let me hear you say amen. amen. The word of God is so deep, amen? amen? We're looking into the mysteries of redemption, and we see that God, when he does something, he finishes the work. Can you say amen? Amen few more quotations before we close. The Great Controversy, page 425 says, Those who are living upon the earth when the intercession of Christ shall cease in the sanctuary above. In other words, when Jesus Christ steps out of the most holy place to come back the second time, during that time when probation is closed, it says, Those who are living in that time are to stand in the sight of a holy God without a mediator. Their robes must be spotless. Their characters must be purified from sin by the blood of sprinkling. Where was the blood sprinkled? In the most holy place. Through the grace of God and their own diligent effort, they must be what? Conquerors in the battle with evil. 
while the investigative judgment is going forward in heaven, while the sins of the penitent believers are being removed from the sanctuary, there is to be a special work of what? Purification, a special work of putting away of sin among God's people upon the earth. In other words, friends, listen carefully. As Jesus is cleansing the heavenly sanctuary, blotting out the sin, as our high priest is doing that, we on earth are to work in harmony with our great high priest as he cleanses the heavenly sanctuary of the record of sin. We need to allow him to cleanse the earthly sanctuary of our lives from the experience of sin in these last days. And it's not something that we do, but rather something we allow Him to do in us. Can you say amen? Notice again in the book, Desire of Ages, page 671. The very image of God is to be repro re reproduced in humanity, and the honor of God, the what? The honor of God and the honor of Christ is involved in the perfection of the character of His people. In the last days, Christ wants to finish the work in our lives. And when He does, when we give Him permission to do it, His honor and His character is going to be vindicated once and for all. Satan will be proved as a liar. His accusations are false. And now Christ can come to take us home, to reign with Him throughout the ceaseless ages of eternity. Can you say amen? What, has be, what He has begun at the altar and offering at the cross he finishes in the most holy place. And friends, as a result of letting Jesus do this in us, notice what we can experience after. Acts 3, 19, it says, Repent ye therefore and be what? Converted. That your sins may be blotted out. Where does Jesus blot out sin? In the most holy place in the last days. Then it says, as a result, when the times of refreshing, when what times? The times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. Where's the presence of the Lord? In the most holy place. In other words, friends, if we let Jesus fully convert us and, and, and change us, we experience the depth of repentance, Jesus then can blot out sin and he, we can experience the refreshing, the latter rain that enables us to give the message in the last days. How can we have a most holy experience? Friends, this whole sermon is summed up with one point. Before we give that, how many of you would like to have this experience? Amen. How many of you long for Jesus to finish the work in your life? Amen. How can we experience a most holy experience? All we have to do, friends, is watch the Lamb. Amen. To behold the Lamb to take your eyes off yourself and off one another and watch the Lamb. You know why? When we watch the Lamb, the Bible says that as we behold in a glass the glory of the Lord, we are changed into the same image from glory to glory even as by the Spirit of the Lord as a result of beholding, we become changed. Friends, just watch the Lamb. And after watching the Lamb, Revelation 14, 4 says, These are they which not only watch the Lamb, but they follow the Lamb whithersoever he goes. Where did the Lamb go? Where is he now? In the most holy place. So watch him, what he's doing right now, but then by faith go there with him. And friends, as we do, when we go into the most holy place, you know what we find? We find, according to Hebrews 4, 15 and 16, we find that we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in how many points? All points tempted like as we are yet without sin. Friends, when we go into the most holy place, we find that we have a high priest that is able to sympathize with us. Therefore... Let us come boldly to the throne of grace that we might obtain mercy and find help in time of need. Watch the Lamb and then follow the Lamb. And when we go there where the Lamb is interceding for us, 
we find that at the throne of God where all power and purity presides, there is someone that has walked in our shoes. Therefore, friends, my fellow watchmen, look around to see the signs, but then look up and watch the Savior. And friends, as we do, when we look up, we see that in this time of awful solemnity, we don't have to be afraid. Why? Because as we look up, we see that before the throne of God above, we have a strong and perfect plea, a great high priest whose name is love, whoever lives and pleads for me. My name is graven on his hand, and my name is written on his heart, and I know that while in heaven he stands, no tongue can bid me to depart. Watch the Lamb, friends. Why? Because when we look at ourselves, we see all the defects of our life. And we think to ourselves, how in the world can I perfectly reproduce the character of God? I fall so short of the glory of God. I am so inconsistent. I make so many mistakes. How can I have this most holy experience? Oh, friends, that's the problem. You're looking at yourself. But watch the Lamb. Look at Christ. For when we look at ourselves, we don't see how we can be saved. But when we look at Jesus, we don't see how we can be lost. Because he has made provision for us. So you know what we need to do? We need to gaze upon Jesus. And we need to glance upon ourselves. We need to gaze and glance. We need to glance at ourselves in self-examination and searching our hearts. But then we need to gaze on Jesus. But the problem is, the reason why sometimes messages like this can be discouraging is because we are not gazing on Jesus. We're gazing upon ourselves and we're glancing at Jesus. We focus so much within. We see how, fall, how short we fall. Stop gazing at yourself, friends. Yes, glance at yourself, but turn your eyes upon Jesus. Watch the Lamb. Behold the Lamb. Follow the Lamb. And my last verse, when we do, we have this assurance. Philippians 1 and verse 6 says, Being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it unto the day of Jesus Christ. Tonight as we close, while our high priest ministers above, let's allow him to perfect and to finish the faith. Is that your desire tonight? If that's your prayer and desire, I invite you to bow your heads and close your eyes. Listen carefully to the words of this song. For behold, before the throne of God above, there's one that has walked in your shoes, one that has experiences, experienced your trials and heartaches. And he not only died for you, but he also lives for you tonight. Listen carefully to the words of this song. Commit your life to Christ. Before the throne. Satan tempts me to die. 
thankful for Jesus. Oh, friends, what would we do without Jesus? What would we do? Praise him tonight. Amen. He died for us and yet he lives for us. He's begun our faith and he's promised to finish it. You see, friends, tonight we can know the signs and still not be saved. But if you know Jesus, you cannot be lost. I want to know Jesus, don't you? I want to know him more intimately. I want to serve him more faithfully. I want to love him more deeply. And tonight as we close, how many of you want to say with me, Lord, help me to take my eyes off of myself, my problems, my issues, my defects. Lord, help me to take my eyes off of others. Help me, dear Jesus, to watch the Lamb that I might have a most holy experience. How many of you want to watch the Lamb and follow the Lamb wherever He goes? And you want God to finish the work. If that's your prayer and desire, I invite you to go with me to your knees as we bow down before the throne of grace to claim the mercy and help that we need so desperately right now. Let us pray as we close. Father in heaven, Lord, we are so thankful for the story of redemption this story that we are all a part of. And Lord, tonight we are so thankful that the story has a happy ending. We're so thankful, Lord Jesus, for dying and shedding your blood that the demands of the law could be satisfied. We thank you, Lord, that you not only paid our debt in full, but you also made provision for us through your spirit to live a brand new life. We thank you, Lord Jesus, 
that you're not only the author, the beginner and originator of our faith, but in the most holy place as you ever lived to intercede for us, in the place where all purity and power resides, that you have the ability by your blood to perfect our faith, to make us like you. Father, we're tired of being like ourselves. We want to be like Jesus. Teach us to be like Jesus, to be more loving, to be more holy. Forgive us for our selfishness, our sin, and our pride. Lord, we open the door of our hearts tonight and we pray that you, Lord, would come into the most holy place of our lives, which is not really a most holy place. It's a most unholy place. Our hearts and minds is a most unholy place, but make it a holy place where you can reside as King of kings and Lord of lords. Lord, we thank you that in this controversy between truth and righteousness, and sin and deception that your righteousness and truth is going to prevail and we pray that it would prevail in our lives show us Lord where we need to come up higher reveal to us as we glance at ourselves help us to see our true condition in your sight but then help us to gaze upon you that by beholding we may may become changed into your image. Lord, we pray for this experience and we thank you that through Christ, unlike through man where it's not possible through Christ, all things are possible. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for hearing this prayer. Bless us now as we dismiss, not from your presence, but with your presence. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen.